Thanks, Kathy, and uh, thanks for the invitation to join, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, seems a bit strange to maybe to talk about heat stress as I look out the window and I see snow and the temperature started in single digits, but the reality is uh, now is a great time to talk about uh, heat stress. Is certainly, you know, we expect that uh, we'll have some of that during the summer, obviously, this year as we do, as we do most summers. Um, so I'm actually going to spend a lot of time today probably more quoting and, and sharing with you some research that others have done, uh, University of Florida, University of Arizona, um, some other places where they've really been leaders in this area. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of heat stress focused research here at Cornell, uh, but at the same time, heat stress is a, is a real deal uh, for us here in the Northeast, um, as it is in lots of places. And, um, you know, I think we're getting the message from the standpoint of uh, cooling and holding areas and things like that. I think we're, we're largely getting the message relative to cooling and lactating cow pens and things like that. But I, I still don't see very much cooling applied and heat stress mitigation or abatement applied in uh, in dry cow groups anyway, and certainly not in, in also pre-fresh and sometimes even fresh groups. So, so that's kind of what we're going to spend our time on today. Um, the reality is that heat stress during the, the dry and the transition period has actually quite profound implications for the cow, and not just for the cow, but also for her calf. And you know, I'll share with you uh, some of the recent work that Jeff Dahl's group has done at University of Florida that really has illuminated this quite nicely and, and to me is, is quite compelling. Okay. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to do a few different things today. We're going we're gonna to review some recent research focused on heat stress in, in transition cows. Um, we're going to think about and, and consider some of the changes that take place in cows that result from heat stress, um, not only during lactation, but also what we know during the dry period or dry or transition period or what we think might be the case. And then uh, we'll, we'll conclude by just discussing some management and traditional strategies to optimize success of these transition cows during uh, heat stress. So just to start off, I've got, a, I've got a slide here that came from a review that, that uh, again, Jeff Dahl's group put together several years ago and, and actually have you know, some more studies since then that we could add to this. But essentially what this slide shows is the results in, in terms of uh, postpartum milk yield, okay, from, dry, from cooling cows during the dry period, okay? And there's nine different studies here represented and the black bars would indicate the cows that were cooled during the dry period, the milk yield of those cows, um, the, the white bars are those that were, were not cooled. And, um, and in fact, in most of these studies, cows were cooled after calving. So this really represents the effects of prepartum uh, cooling applied to these cows during the entire dry period. The numbers on top of each set of bars is actually the milk yield difference in kilograms, right? And so you, to get to pounds, you multiply by two and add a little bit. And I think what's really compelling about this slide is that in all nine of these cases, they saw postpartum milk yield responses ranging anywhere from three or four pounds per cow per day, all the way up to, you know, 15 or 16 pounds. And that may be extreme, but, uh, but it still tells us that we get a very consistent milk yield response postpartum from cooling cows during the dry period. Now, one of the things they also have done in some of their studies would be to look at some of the metabolites that we tend to look at, focus on energy metabolism, such as NEFA or ketones. Um, and these are some of the, the data there. They, they haven't done this extensively, but they've done this reasonably well. Um, you know, one of the things they, they typically see is, uh, is decreased dry matter intake in these cows that are heat stressed, and that's not a surprise. Um, you know, in their study, again, they, they lost uh, four to five pounds of dry matter intake before calving, uh, did not see any big difference post-calving, but they certainly saw the loss in intake pre-calving. Um, in terms of things like uh, like NEFAs and ketones, they actually saw um, lower NEFAs anyway, and even to some extent lower ketones in cows that were actually heat stressed. Now, I think that that is that may surprise some of you. you might think those would be increased, but I think it's an indication that these cows may be not adapting well to lactation because certainly we'd expect some increase in in body fat mobilization and NEFAs, and then it implies these cows are maybe compromised relative to their adaptation to lactation. We'll, we'll do more on this later, okay? In terms of the effects on the calf, um, again, they, Jeff and, and uh, uh, Chatao summarized this uh, a few years ago um, relative to birth weight, and of course, birth weight is a fairly sensitive indicator of, of heat stress anyway. And we see, again, results from eight different studies here that all show, you know, basically reduction in birth weight 
um, in those calves if dams are heat stressed, um, you know, during that late dry period. Okay, and so, you know, I guess maybe not surprising to, to see that affects stress on those calves, and and maybe not surprised to think they might be compromised coming out of the gate. Okay. Well, again, one of the things that, that Jeff has done um, and his group has, has done in the last few years is really looked at what are the implications of uh, heat stress in that transition cow, right, or that dry cow on the calf itself after she's born. And again, these are data from one of their studies. And what we see here is that calves that were cooled um, had higher birth weights. And again, you could, you could turn that the other way around, say if they're heat stressed, they had lower birth weights. But um, if they're cooled, they had higher birth weights. Um, these calves that were, were born to dams that were cooled had higher weaning weights. Um, you know, weaning weight or body weight gain to weaning was not statistically or significantly different. But again, you can see uh, there's not a huge study here, but you can maybe argue a numerical difference here. The cooled calves gained a little bit better, um, you know, and, and et cetera. One of the things that's, that's interesting that we'll circle back on here in just a minute is if you looked at colostrum IgG content, right? So immunoglobulin concentration of colostrum, um, it was actually the same between the, the heat stress dams and the cool dams. So it looks like colostrum quality, at least by itself, is, is okay. Now, looking more here at the calf, and despite, uh, despite the fact that colostrum quality was the same, and, and they manage these calves the same from the standpoint of colostrum feeding, um, these dams that were, that, or these calves anyway, that were, from, that were born, to heat stress uh, moms basically had lower total protein concentration here at the top on the left and also lower IgG concentration in, in blood, okay? And so that would tell us that, you know, given the colostrum IgG content was the same, is that these calves probably were not absorbing the immunoglobulins or, that, or the components of that colostrum as well, and so they actually would be considered to be more great, greater risk for failure passive transfer transfer, so FPT um, in those calves. So again, looks like those calves are, they may, be, they may be being fed the colostrum, but they're not absorbing it the way they should, and so it looks like they're compromised in that way. Okay, on the right is just one of the immune assays that they did here looking at, uh, um, looking at immune cell proliferation in these calves, and, and again, what they basically found here is that, uh, is that these calves that were, uh, um, uh, calves that were born to uh, that were cooled at, or born to, to moms that were cooled um, had better immune cell response and things like that. So again, it certainly implies that if we cool these these dry cows, we're going to have calves that are going to hit the ground and have better immune function and, and potentially growth. Okay. So one of the things they did recently, and this was just published here a few months ago, um, is actually they combined uh, Jeff's group combined data from five experiments conducted over five consecutive summers there in Florida. So they were able to put some, some little better numbers here. Um, we're able to look more at calf survival and calf performance. Just to give you a sense for how, how these animals were managed in general, generally a 45-day dry period. Um, again, they were blocked and assigned to heat stress or cool treatments. The calves got about four quarts of colostrum within four hours of birth. Um, and then they were feeding pasteurized milk twice a day, and you see the feeding rates there. So I think just to give you a sense for, for what they were doing from a calf management standpoint across basically all years of, of these studies. Okay, If you look here at, uh, at just some of the data, again, not huge numbers here, but certainly reasonable numbers. Um, you know, they had, if you look here at uh, the heifer bull ratio, again, probably using sex semen along the way and things like that, but pretty similar between the heat stress and the cooled. Um, you know, if you look down here at the at the p-values, um, a lot of these necessarily not significant statistically, but you know you see numerically anyway, just generally more losses here uh, for for cows or for in these calves that were born to heat stress dams. Um, they had no stillborns in those that were cooled. Um, you see they had maybe uh, again not statistically different, but you see the numbers relative to bull calf mortality. Um, you know, you can, one of the things that was significant was they had simply more calves here, um, leaving her, leaving her pre-puberty, if they were heat stressed uh, before they were born, you know, relative to health or growth or malformation. Um, you know, the, the one down here that's pretty striking to me, and I don't, don't think herds probably track this very well, is if you look here at heifers leaving complete first lactation, 
um, you know, a pretty significant and meaningfully lower percentage of heifers completing first lactation to those that were born during a heat stress scenario, right? And I guess my guess is that herds don't track that very much or, or very often, and it may be one of those hidden losses that, that we see. Interestingly here, and again, in this study, they had actually no effect on birth weight at calving. And so, you know, despite all this stuff, actually, it's just flat out looking at birth weight, there was no significant difference in those means are very, very close to each other relative to, to body weight at calving. Sorry, I said birth weight, but I meant body weight at calving, okay? All right, now they did see some differences, again, as we, as we illuminated earlier, relative to, to at least maybe uh, differences in body weight, uh, at least uh, pre-pubital and during uh, up to one year of age here. Again, they do catch up, it looks like, by the time they actually calve, but, you know, again, that, that difference in body weight seems to persist through at least the first year of life or so if they were born to cooled or, or heat stress dams. And then this is the one that obviously grabs lots of attention as well. This is the milk yield and of these calves that were born during uh, heat stress or they were cooled uh, during that time frame. And again, in this data set, there's about five kilos, so it's 10 or 11 pounds of milk decrease in first lactation in these calves that were that were born to, to dams that were not cooled um, during heat stress, right? So cooling looks like it really improved uh, milk yield performance during first lactation um, in these calves. So again, these are some of the reaching effects relative to heat stress that we probably don't monitor, maybe don't see. Okay, so switch gears here and we'll talk a little bit about the physiological changes here relative to, to heat stress. Um, we probably know more about this in, in lactating cows, um, and this is a lot of work, some of the work that Lance Baumgard and Rob Rhodes have done uh, while they were, when they were at the University of Arizona several years ago. But it's, it's pretty clear that heat stress results in, in quite marked physiological changes and, and change in nutrient use, in, at least in mid-lactation cows. Okay? Now, if any of you have seen talks on heat stress before, you've probably seen this data from this study right here. And this is one of their first studies that they did um, when they were, again, the University of Arizona. Uh, they were very interested in looking at heat stress effects on um, intake milk yield, but also um, metabolism anyway in cows and mid-lactation. And so they had environmental chambers at University of Arizona that allowed them to control both temperature, humidity, and also solar radiation. They had they were able to, to basically light things up in there to, to simulate uh, to simulate the effect of sunlight and, and solar radiation on on uh, on the impact of heat stress. And what they did in the study is they they said, okay, we know that we know that calves are we know that cows when we heat stress them they're going to decrease their feed intake. Um, and certainly expecting decreased milk yield as well. And so what they did from a control standpoint is they said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna pair feed these controls. In other words, we're gonna we're gonna, as the heat stress cows reduce their intake, we're gonna reduce the intake the feed intake of the the you know the controls that are not heat stress just to try to separate out the effects of you know what what effect does intake have versus what effect beyond that does heat stress. Uh, control and so if you see the top this the top of the slide shows the feed intakes and again these are in kilos per day the dots on the far left represent where those animals were at before they they implied the the the, uh, the treatments and again you see here as they heat stress the animals they those animals decrease their feed intake uh, again by design they also restricted the feed intake of the controls so that they would match those of the, the heat stress dams and they did a very nice job doing that Okay. If you go to the bottom here, what you see is if you look at the top line, these would be the, the, the pair fed animals. So these animals that only had their intake uh, decrease, you see their milk yield goes down. Uh, but uh, you know, the heat, the, in, the milk production of the, of the cows that were heat stressed actually went down a lot further. And they, they figured that they, that, that the change in the feed intake accounted for about 50% of the effect of heat stress on milk yield. So it's more than just a feed intake, um, uh, mediated thing relative to the effects of heat stress on lactation anyway in mid-lactation cows, okay? But one of the things they also did, and this is what really caught uh, their attention and a lot of our attention out, out in, uh, who, are, who are watching them do these these studies and looking at this work, is, you know, one of the things that, that you know, if we restrict just a cow that's, restrict feed a cow, um, you know, that is not under heat stress, so she's thermoneutral or whatever, She'll attempt to compensate for that, at least short term, by 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 basically pulling 
Being body condition by mobilizing body conditions should be a negative energy balance. Um, and so she'll try to compensate for that. And that's kind of what you see here in those pear fed uh, animals is that those, those NEFAs, uh, again, indicative of body fat mobilization in those cows, those went up, right? So those, those pear fed cows, they were, they were attempting to still maintain their milk yield um, basically by trying to mobilize body condition and stuff like that. But if you look at the red, and again, this is a striking difference here in these groups. These are the, these are the heat stress dams or he's not dance, but he's stressed cows. They didn't do that, right? So they they were they were clearly adjusting their physiology and, and milk yield, or the the, the sense to, to prioritize milk yield was nowhere near um, uh, a priority for them. Okay, and so Lance put together this, uh, you know, Lance and Rob put together this this cartoon anyway that kind of shows what happens in a thermoneutral uh, pear fed animal, and basically kind of the bottom line here is that. That animal still has the ability to to pull, uh, you know, body fat mo to mobilize body fat, and so NEPA concentrations go up. And she can use that for energy. She can use that to help make milk fat. She can use that to fuel muscle and things like that. And so at least, you know, short term, she tries to compensate for that. Now, obviously, longer term, you know, that's gonna, you know, she can only do that for so long. And uh, but again, she's got Lance and, and Rob coined the term metabolically flexible, right? So she has the ability to kind of adapt to that and adapt and still try to maintain milk yield. The, the difference here, though, is in the heat-stressed animal doesn't seem to do that, right? And so what happens here is she's not mobilizing uh, body fat to any great, great extent. Um, she actually looks like she's pulling uh, uh, amino acids actually out of muscle, right? So she's maybe catabolizing muscle anyway to try to meet glucose needs. And actually, instead of sending that glucose to the mammary gland to make lactose to make milk, She's actually sending it to, to just meet the needs of the tissues, and so um, so again, she's really reprioritizing how she uses those nutrients, and certainly at the expense of milk yield. All right, one of the things they've they've been working on in the last few years, and again, this is actually after Lance moved to Iowa State University and uh, began also doing some work not only in cows but in actually pigs, is Lance began to to realize that one of the things that seems to happen in a heat stressed animal is that her gut integrity actually begins to get impaired and she actually develops what's called uh, a leaky gut syndrome. And obviously our, our gut is designed to, to uh, absorb nutrients. Um, our gut is designed to keep bacteria and the bad things that, that might be uh, in different parts of our GI tract, inside the GI tract and not in the bloodstream. Um, and But it looks like in, in heat stress anyway, that gut integrity is impaired pretty quickly, and that may be one of the major mechanisms here uh, underlying some of these effects of heat stress. Um, one of the things they've also done, this was also in pigs, uh, but I would suspect the same thing might happen in cows. We know that, that you know, there's a few different things, but some of the nutrients like zinc, for example, one of the trace minerals that we think about are important for tissue integrity in general, and they do have some data, and this would be some data again from a pig study showing that uh, some trace mineral supplementation uh, from some improved forms, from some uh, organic forms in this particular case, actually improved uh, intestinal integrity, right? So, you know, we'll talk later about nutritional things we might think about in heat stress animals, but I do think that things that might enhance gut integrity might be some of the things we want to try to do dietarily. Okay. One interesting aside, and this is actually not related to heat stress, but this was some work that Matt Waldron did as a PhD student in our group. We were interested in uh, in interactions of uh, of um, immune function and uh, and metabolism in, in fresh cows. And one of the kind of the things we really found here, what we did, the way we did it is we used uh, we infused something called LPS, which is called lipopolysaccharide. Um, it's actually the component of E. coli that gives it that would give the symptoms related to an E. coli mastitis. So you, but you can infuse uh, pure LPS into the cow, and then you're not giving her actually a bug, um, but you can mimic the effects of an E. coli mastitis. One of the things that Matt and I found, or that Matt found, was that you know in these cows that were that were given this LPS challenge in early lactation, they had pretty sharp increase in insulin and pretty. Uh, dramatic decreases in NEFA. It looks almost identical to the heat stress um, scenario, which kind of maybe leads lends further credence to the notion that what we actually may have um, when we get heat stressed animals is actually some compromised um, tissue integrity 
where you're actually getting almost like a systemic immune response um, in these cows. So it's pretty, again, stay tuned on this whole story, but it's, it's, um, it's a story that's coming together pretty nicely out there. All right, so what do we know specifically about heat stress and effects on metabolic regulation of the transition cow? Bottom line is not much. Um, um, but, you know, but again, it's of interest to say, okay, you know, how does the stuff we now know from mid-lactation, does it apply to this fresh cow? And so um, this was done out of, this study here was recently published as well. It was done out of Germany. Um, pretty small study. They basically had 14 cows in the study. Uh, those of you, if any of you live in, in areas that really get heat stress, you're going to laugh at uh, what they called heat stress in this study. So they said, okay, heat stress was six days at 82 degrees Fahrenheit and 52% relative humidity, which for most of us is probably just a nice summer day. Um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily think about that as, as being extreme heat stress by any means. Um, and the control anyway was, was thermoneutral. Um, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 69% uh, relative humidity. They were, they, and they were also pair-fed these animals to match the heat stress controls. They, they put the, the, they applied the treatments in chambers and then did them for basically a six-day period um, uh, where they basically had both groups that were neutral. They had a transition six days of heat stress during both prepartum and postpartum. Okay. If you just look here at NEFA, um, again, that was one of the big things that really changed in these mid-lactation cows. Um, you know, it kind of looks like in, in this particular study, um, you know, they, they behave pretty similarly to cows during uh, mid-lactation. So these cows that are heat stressed, uh, you know, they probably don't, I mean, you know, if you look here, they, uh, they kind of all, all increase their their, uh, they increase their NEFA during period two, but not a whole lot of difference between the, the pair fed ones and the heat stress. After calving, you see a bigger difference here. So it looks like pre calving, maybe not as big of a change metabolically as maybe we see in that lactating cow. Um, they also looked at, at blood urea concentrations and plasma creatinine. So these, are, these would both relate to protein metabolism in different ways. And they did observe that heat stress did seem to increase concentrations of those both prepartum and postpartum. So it looks like there may be some, some things going on with muscle metabolism in these cows and, and amino acid use that may need to be dug into a bit further. Okay. Uh, one of these, uh, just a quick uh, side to a, a behavioral study here. This is actually done um, in Iran, but with collaboration from, from uh, University of Illinois. And they had some data here on heat stress versus cooled uh, dry cows relative to the prepartum intake. Again, seeing a a decrease here in, in if they were heat stressed, saw a trend for decreased eating time, saw lower rumination time, lower trend for total chewing time, and more standing time if they're heat stressed. So again, seeing behavioral changes that are consistent with um, with lower intake in those cows, and again with, with actually quite a bit more standing. I mean that's you know you're looking here at that's almost an hour and a half more standing time per day, and that's that's pretty meaningful relative to just behavioral changes in these cows. So just to summarize here, um, in terms of the physiology and, and behavior um, in these heat stress transition cows, pre-calving, uh, lower feed intake during heat stress, uh, NEPA increases are pretty similar in heat stress and pair fed cows. There are some evidence of changes in, in muscle or protein metabolism. Again, we don't know all what that means, but you know, it looks like they're, they're maybe wasting a bit things like that. Heat stress, decreased uh, chewing time, and increased standing time. Uh, postpartum, that adipose tissue looks to be more refractory to mobilization. And again, um, you know, so these cows probably don't adapt the way they should to, to lactation. Uh, there's probably greater demand for, for, for glucose um, as, they, they part as they steer that away from milk synthesis into just maintaining tissues. And again, there's further evidence of muscle mobilization or change in the metabolism. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, kind of wrap up here and just talk about some things related to management nutritional strategies to optimize our success in heat stress, okay? The reality is that there's no substitute for cooling, okay? I mean, we can do all, of, all the other things we want to with, with diet and other things that I think could potentially help, but the reality is um, there, there's really no substitute for cooling. And if you're in places where um, you don't have cows housed in barns, obviously shade, you know, as, as part of that. And when I say cooling, 
again, I'm not an engineer, but I'm, we're talking evaporative cooling in most scenarios, which means we're talking uh, fans and uh, soakers or water in some way, shape, or form, right? So we've got we to gotta wet the cows uh, to the skin and then uh, use, the, use the fans to basically evaporate that off, and that is, that is cooling. And you can certainly find resources on cooling not only at the ProDairy website, but also uh, from places like uh, University of Wisconsin, Kansas State. Um, on the private sector side, Alanco Animal Health has done a great job They've actually assembled a resource manual. Dr. Tom Bailey, who is, I think, now retired from Alanco, uh, Tom did a great, and his team did a great job of, of really assembling almost a manual on, on uh, really good resources in terms of the engineering or the facility side of how you put good cooling in place. So I'd refer you to those sources. It looks like, based on, I talked to Jeff Dahl a few weeks ago at Western Dairy Management Conference, that that we actually need to start cooling these cows even beginning far off, right? So it's not just a close-up thing. Uh, they've done some work that would now suggest that, that you really need to cool cows beginning during the far off period. Part of that is because if you don't do that, one of the things that heat stress looks like it does is it interferes with the mammary glands and its involution and its regeneration during the dry period. So if we're not cooling those cows, then we're not getting that happening the way it should. And that may be part of the milk yield uh, response um, uh, post calving. So it looks like we got to cool the entire dry period, optimally anyway. That doesn't mean you might not get you might not get some benefit from cooling close off, uh, close up, close up. Um, you know, but ideally you're doing it the whole the whole time. I think one of the things from a management standpoint is even even really paying even more attention to stocking densities and and cow heifer competition. You guys see some you'll see some bunk space recommendations here. Um, you know, we can we might be able to 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 not get to maybe give a little less space. We're actually splitting out the first calf heifers from the older cows, just because I, I think about those two things as they work together. Um, we know that heat stress cows will stand more, and so an overstocking will tend to promote the same thing, and so they probably just compound each other, right? So we really need to pay attention there. Uh, water availability is really key as well. Um, and, you know, so again, not only clean and plentiful, again, if, if you won't drink out of it, then uh, why should you expect her to do it? You know, and, and we, we might give a guideline, you know, again, not a lot of research here, but thinking four inches minimum anyway of linear water space across, ideally multiple waters in the group. One of the things we know is that if there's only single waters in certain groups, um, you know, certain cows can really tie up those waters and things like that. And so, um, you get more of the social interaction. So ideally, multiple waters in the group to uh, to, mit, to help uh, facilitate good water intake across the group. Now, of course, folks have done changes, and there certainly has been work in terms of, uh, of lactating cow diets and, and things that people might try to do during heat stress to either lower the heat of, of, uh, of, of digestion or improve rumen uh, fermentation or otherwise help the cow deal with, with um, some of the uh, electrolyte things and stuff like that. You know, and so a pretty common practice would be to, to, uh, to, to decrease heated digestion would be to replace lower, you know, some of the at least lower digestibility forage sources, non-forage fiber that have higher digestibility. We might think about some supplemental dietary fats to provide energy, but not necessarily provide a lot of heat. Um, you know, we, we want to mitigate any risk of rumen acidosis. These cows are generally going to be at higher risk of rumen acidosis if they're heat stressed, and there's probably mo there's multiple kind of biological reasons behind that. And so, you know, we may moderate starch content. We may put in some yeast or yeast culture or other types of feed additives to help rumen, rumen fermentation. Uh, you know, we're going to want to, you know, typically think about increasing or supplementing uh, potassium or dietary decad and potassium carbonate sources or other things like that, of course, that may be, that's going to be different in this close-up dry cow. We'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute. But, you know, potassium supplementation is something that typically we would think about. Okay. The, the part B of this is that when we think about control feeding studies in, in heat stress transition cows, they, they, at least to my knowledge, they're essentially um, uh, non-existent. I, I did find one study done overseas where they looked at feeding cassava as a, uh, as a non-forage fiber source and energy source, but uh, most of you aren't going to have much access to cassava and things like that. So, and it was not a miracle feed anyway, but it was, you know, but I'm just giving you the point. There was, there's like nothing out there. Okay. 
So, but if we put we put the whole thing together um, and kind of what makes sense, again, we do need to keep in mind there there is going to be some, you know, altered fermentation and propensity for rumen acidosis. And so, you know, thinking about non-forage fiber sources while controlling starch um, or not going overboard with starch probably makes sense. Uh, yeast and yeast culture type additives to improve the efficiency of fermentation and aid transition. And I think, you know, again, um, we're going to try to stay away from some of our sodium sources because of uh, DCAD in this dry, in this pre-fresh cow and, and risk for hypocalcemia. But there are some mineral sources that, uh, that have um, pretty good buffering capacity associated with them from a ruminal standpoint, and maybe good sources, or likely are good sources also of calcium and magnesium for these cows, which we may need, which we really need anyway. And so there's commercial forms of some of the calcium magnesium dolomites, and maybe some other slow release buffers that we can think about in, in diets for these cows beginning before calving. Okay, again, the key would be uh, probably not sodium bicarb because of uh, increased sodium there and, and uh, effects on DCAD in the, in the wrong direction in the pre-calving cow. Uh, we need to factor in these cows are going to have increased tissue demands for glucose, and so we're going to make sure we have the appropriate supply of the liver. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we certainly can do to help that would be remensin supplementation. So you see our, our guidelines here, pre-calving and post-calving relative to milligrams per day. And then, uh, you know, look at these guidelines for starch levels anyway. Um, you know, again, maybe favoring some non-forage fiber as part of both of these diets to give some, some uh, still good, give good fermentable, fermentable ener energy, but maybe not too much starch. We're going to focus again on uh, efficient delivery of metabolizable protein amino acids. Again, we don't understand a lot about these changes in protein metabolism in these cows, but we're going to make sure we have good protein supply. Um, you know, there may be opportunities for individual fatty acids. I think that's an area that would be interesting to look at. I'm not aware of a lot of data there. Again, feeding some additional fat would be a common strategy in lactating cow diets. I would tend to probably not do it in these transition diets, uh, but you know, again, that may not may not be exclusive and maybe worth looking at. I think the, uh, the the thing to also really kind of keep in mind is is that likely anyway in a heat stress environment, these cows uh, are going to have some likely going to have some intestinal compromised intestinal or gut integrity, um, and that's probably part of the mechanism. And so you know we're going to think about our trace mineral supplementation on uh, use of improved sources, so things like some of the uh, hydroxy sources that are out there, and also some of the some of the organic um, you know complexes or chelates out there relative to, to trace mineral sources. And you know I, I I'm pretty compelled that that those are certainly things we probably want them in the diets regardless. Uh, but particularly in this heat stress scenario, um, we probably stand the chance of seeing some benefit there. We want to make sure our dietary antioxidants are, are adequate. So again, vitamin E, selenium, uh, copper. But probably not excessive, right? Copper in excess may actually impair some tissue integrity, so we want to be careful. And my my general kind of thumb rule is no more than about 20 ppm total diet copper. And again, I think on the farm level, this last point is really important because I think that you know cows are proud in these heat stress scenarios are probably going to be really sensitive to you know what I'll call anti-quality factors in feeds, and those could be mycotoxin issues, those could be poor silage fermentation. Uh, heating of the TMR, so all the stuff that that hopefully we're doing relative to really good, uh, you know, silage, you know, bunker pile management, relative to feed bunk management, maybe again feeding a second, you know, feeding twice in the summertime, for example, to keep the feed fresh. Um, there certainly are TMR preservatives that can be used to help minimize issues with heating, because I think again we get heating in the TMR, it would certainly be an indication of anti quality. And you know you got probably some stuff growing in there that that may not be helping you from a gut standpoint. And if you got you know, compromised gut integrity, that's going to be a, a challenge. Okay, just like in other time points, we're going to manage that dietary decad. Um, so prepartum, we're going to use anionic supplements. We want to certainly make sure we're monitoring urine pH. Um, and cows may acidify a little bit differently if they're heat stressed. So we want to make sure we're actually using the urine pHs. And again, we like pHs down at. Uh, six or a bit below um, as long as they're well managed. So five and a half to six, we're using some of the commercial DCAD sources and, and we're well managed is a, is a pretty good place to live. Post calving, um, again, potential look at incre including potassium sources to increase that DCAD. Again, the data in general would probably support that. Okay, And there are other nutrients we can think about relative to, to chromium, uh, relative 
to the choline. Um, the last one's here, niacin and betaine. Uh, betaine is used in poultry pretty routinely in heat stress scenarios. Um, niacin uh, actually will, uh, you know, there's some thought that it, it actually may uh, help cow dissipate heat. The data on both of those, at least what's been done so far in dairy, is is pretty mixed. So, you know, there may be a role here, but at least as 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 far as the data, at least that I'm aware of, um, I haven't seen a whole lot that says, okay, you know, these are really nutrients that we ought to be thinking about in a heat stress scenario. So just to summarize, and then if there are any questions at all, I'd be happy to, to take them. Otherwise, uh, you can certainly feel free to send me a note. Um, uh, again, kind of the bottom line is that, you know, not only does heat stress have profound implications for the cow, but also her calf. Um, and so I think if we only, if we only gauge um, our our heat stress opportunity based upon what happens to say lactating cow milk yield um, or repro performance or things like that, you know, we probably really underestimate the implications uh, not only for the transition cow but also for that calf because that's really something that's going to take, you know, the reality is unless you've got it really increased uh, disease or health issues, you know, it's two years down the road before you see um, you know that 10 pounds less milk in those in those calves that were born during heat stress. So, you know that's the that's the thing that makes it hard to hard to catch, and also the kind of that slow drag in terms of herd removal. Um, heat stress certainly appears to significantly alter the physiology and metabolism of cows during during lactation during the dry period, and I think there are implications for how we look at diets. Uh, but again, kind of bottom line here is that you know th there really is no um, no substitute for getting good cooling. Um, and heat abatement strategies in these groups. Again, we can do things with diet, we do things with management, and those will help. But you know, I truly think that that uh, that we got to cool these cows. So, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity as always. And uh, again, my email address is is there if you care to send me a note. And uh, again, I'll thank Kathy and for all her work to coordinate this uh, this webinar series and Dairy Business for helping us with uh, promote it as well as well as helping us get them online. So, Tom, the, the question is, what is your definition of heat stress? Heat stress, T-H-I plus time, days? Here, I'll just, here, what I'm going to do is just pass it over to you so you can see. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things is so I, I, would, I would tend to look at it using some of the T-H-I work that, and Bob Collier and the group at Arizona just revised a bunch of that. Um, and so I would I would probably refer you there um, through, and I think if you if you Google Bob or Robert Collier or Bob Collier T H I Arizona uh, that'll get you to the, to some of those resources. So um, in terms of time, again, some of the stuff is is you know again some of the stuff out of uh, Arizona is shorter term stuff. You know, you know I, again you see pretty profound changes in a, in a hurry in, in some of these animals and. And, you know, again, even this transition cows, you know, you know, a week or two and things like that, I think probably has some impact. Now, obviously, obviously the, the longer, the longer that you're in a, in a high THI area um, in terms of part of the year, the bigger the opportunity is. But I think, you know, even in, even in New York, and I've seen some of the stuff that Jeff Dahl has presented, um, I think about the only state in the, in the, in the U.S. that doesn't have meaningful Heat stress from an economic standpoint, and where some of this stuff isn't uh, may not be fully applicable, would be Alaska. Okay, so if once you're in Alaska, um, you know I think we've got some opportunities here to to not only improve, but it's going to be economical. And again, Jeff, I refer you to some of Jeff Dahl's stuff because he's done a much better, um, better, better, more work on this than I have. Um, the reason of decrease in room pH. So what is according to the reason of decrease in room pH during heat stress? I think there's probably a few different things. Um, I think that, you know, one, you know, obviously cows tend to, uh, you know, the more the saliva ends up uh, on the ground sometimes than ends up uh, going back into the room. And we know it's an important buffering capacity. Um, there are some changes in acid-base balance in those cows that, that probably has some effects there too. And we certainly would affect, see some effects, see some different, expect some differences in feeding behavior, et cetera. We also know that cows that stand uh, that are standing don't tend to ruminate as much, so there's multiple probably reasons there for that. Uh, and the last one I see is uh, organic selenium. Uh, you know, I, th I think again, you know, it would, um, 
I think, in, again, improved sources of, of trace minerals and, and organic selenium would be one of them. Um, you know, that would make sense. I probably can't draw the, the linkages there um, as tightly as I can for things like zinc with, in, with gut or tissue integrity. Uh, but, you know, certainly think about selenium um, and oxidative balance and vitamin E as well. And, um, you know, some of the work that was done in Italy a few years ago would show that, that you know, uh, cows that are heat stressed are under increased oxidative stress. And so it would make sense to do, um, to be using some of the better forms of selenium um, and, and obviously, you know, make sure I get our vitamin E supplementation you know, um, there as well. I mean, in terms of selenium, you know, again, we're typically limited to 0.3, at, 0.3 ppm added, so it would make sense to at least have part of that coming from a organic source. Um, in terms of vitamin E levels, you know, we tend to recommend 1,800 units a day during the dry period and 750 to 1,000 during lact in lactating cows. And those are probably, you know, again, there's no data on this. Those are probably, you know, we're, we probably, I probably feel comfortable with those levels in a heat stress scenario as well, uh, because again, I think those are good solid supplementation levels in general. But again, that may modify if we end up someday with some research that helps us really define that. So, we have another question, Tom. What level of chromium seems to help with heat stress? Same levels pre and postpartum? Yeah, again, I don't know if anybody's done any work relative to chromium, titrating out chromium levels and things like that. I mean, the standard dose has been, you know, eight milligrams of chromium. Uh, per cow per day, and I think that I think that equates to around 20 grams per day of of the actual commercially available chromium propionate source. But you gotta, I would go with the with the manufacturer's recommendations on that rather than what I'm pulling out of my head. I think I, I'm quoting that accurately. Um, the uh, um, you know nobody's done that work. Again, I I can't um, I can't maybe again that one's maybe a, a not uh, quite as easy to draw lots of lines relative to, to you know, uh, heat stress other than, you know, we certainly recognize there's roles there in, in probably insulin and glucose metabolism that, that and also immune function as well. So there's, there's some reasons why we might think about that, that nutrient as well. Okay. So someone is asking if your slides will be available. So now the webinar will be available on the Proteary webinar um, site, you just can just Google that, but I, someone's wondering if the slides will be as well. Yeah, just send me an email at tro2 at cornell.edu, and I'll be happy to, to reply with a, a PDF of the slides. Okay. So, if anybody wants them. All right. So, that's that's all the questions for today. Again, Tom, thanks for a really great job. This was yep. an excellent thanks presentation. For, thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your days. Yeah, thanks.